Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ryan Bijan, host of Cowtown Movie Classics. And tonight we're gonna to do something a little bit different by paying tribute to one of America's greatest filmmakers. On August 7th, 2023, we lost a, a fabulous director, writer, producer, Mr. William Friedkin. Uh, you may know him best as the Academy Award-winning director behind The French Connection, to live and die in LA, and of course, The Exorcist. But tonight, we're gonna to do something a little bit different by showing what's perhaps Mr. Freakin's most controversial film, Cruising from 1980. Joining us tonight is friend of Cowtown Movie Classics and film historian, Mr. David Delval. How are you doing today, David? Hi, I'm glad to, we're doing this tribute to Mr. William Friedkin. He certainly yeah. deserves it. Oh, absolutely. Uh, what was your first impression of Cruising when it came out back in the day? <laughs> My first impression of Cruising was uh, surprise, shock, uh, couldn't wait to see it. And I saw it in Westwood here in Los Angeles with the actor Reggie Nalder, who played Mr. Barlow in Stephen King's Salem's Lot. Oh, wow. And Reggie was Viennese and 25 years older than me at the time. And with that broken accent, he said, well, we've got to go see the letter men working on each other. They're working, <laughs> they're working on each other. And when I finally figured out, oh, they're working on each other. Oh, oh, this is going to be X-rated, right? Yeah. And uh, so since I'm introducing this, let sure. me just say this to the audience. You're about to see a movie that is not what it appears to be at all. Is it a murder mystery? Is it a police procedural? No. Is it a gay thriller? Perhaps. It is, without a doubt, a horror film. You will see in this movie Al Pacino as a detective undercover, but he does not pull a gun. He does not throw himself over the hoods of cars. He does not chase anybody. This is a movie that's all quiet. It's all sounds. It's all shadows. Watch it, try and follow it, and remember, everything you see is not as it seems. And there are, to my knowledge, four killers in this, not one. You be the judge, and then we'll talk about it after you've watched William Friedman's Cruise. All right, thank you so much, David. So please stick around after the film for our post-show conversation. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> We have a lot to talk about. Oh, so, yes. <laughs> without further ado, starring Al Pacino, Karen Allen, directed by the late William Friedkin, Cruising. What does that ending even mean? Well, for one thing, the movie is very clear in the way it opens and closes. It opens with the severed hand being found in the Hudson River, and it closes with the Hudson River at the same time with Willie DeVille's music. What you realize is there is a serial killer in New York that is targeting gay men, specifically gay men that are into leather and bondage. That's all we know. But the original opening of this John Rishi, the uh, gay writer that we share a hometown together, we're both from El Paso, Texas. John was asked to look at this movie before it was released. When John looked at the movie, the first thing you see is a, is a brick wall that says in chalk, someone wrote, we are everywhere. John Rishi saw that and said, Billy, you can't put that, you've got to cut that out because that implies something with gay people that has nothing to do with catching a killer. You're getting the wrong message there. So John Rishi said, no, cut that out. So the movie opens as you saw it with them discovering the severed hand. And then we go immediately into a kind of ninth circle of hell as we go to the mine shaft, which is a leather bar in the truck area of New York. Now, the problem with Friedkin, with his ideas involving the gay community, <laughs> is that there are no bars like that. There's no gay people like that. There's no leather guys like that. This is all fantasy. First of all, gay guys don't walk up to each other and say hips or lips. Wait, come <laughs> on, that's ridiculous. 
we don't the 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 keychains the 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 uh, leather apparel all that yes it's there but Billy hadn't a clue what any of it meant he didn't what about, know what it meant he wasn't about, supposed to know what it meant he's a heterosexual man who's yeah. making a movie that happens to be set in these leather bars by the the trucks that's yeah. all he knew now to his credit Billy went down to jockstrap night with his cameraman. And they went in there wearing nothing but jock straps. I'd love to have seen a picture of that. But, you know, Billy was fearless. But the thing is, he really did not know anything about the gay community. And he discovered a great deal while he made that movie. Pacino had no idea at all. Although, you know, when actors tell you they don't know anything about homosexuality, I'm sorry. If you've been an actor on Broadway or you've come to Los Angeles to audition for movies, you have dealt with homosexuals, you have dealt with gay producers, you've dealt with gay directors. Some of them are nice. They're just like everybody else. Everybody's got an agenda. Everybody uses power to get what they want. There's no point saying it doesn't exist because it does. Yeah. And I've lived in Hollywood over half a century, so believe me, I know. But I'm saying that Cruising is a remarkable movie because it was made by people. It literally guides itself because there's more than one killer. The sequence where Stuart, the gay music student from Columbia, has a meeting with his spectral father. Mm -hmm. Steve Burns has the same issues with his father. Now, there's even a thought that Karen Allen is a figment of his imagination in that. Mm -hmm because he, there really are no women in this movie. Right. And the sex he has with her is gay sex. It's like anal penetration. What's he doing now with his girlfriend that was gonna get married? We know nothing about her. We're never given a backstory about her. She's just there for him to have sex with and for him to come to at the end. That's it. That's all Karen Allen does in that movie. There are no other women in it at all. The only other movie I can think of that's devoid of women is like uh, John Carpenter's The Thing. Yeah. No women in that. But in this, there's no women in it because we're in a world without them, you know, and uh, Friedkin plays it like a horror film. But I do believe that, for example, the next door neighbor of Al Pacino, the kid that, that gets killed at the end, the man they've arrested is in the hospital when that man's murdered. So Pacino killed him because he had sex with him. Yeah. So now the movie ends with us looking at Steve Burns, who is now a gay serial killer. Yeah. That's what's going on. Now, why Karen Allen puts on the hat, the glasses, and you hear the music and the chains and she walks in, she probably doesn't exist. That's yeah. probably just the alter ego of, because Al Pacino's character is so passive in this. Then there's a very telling scene in Paul Servino's office when he shows Al, who's just walked in, this recruit, he shows him this all these Polaroids of the murder victims. And you know what Pacino's dialogue is? Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I love it. What? Now, the other thing that's utterly fictitious is Gene Davis, Brad Davis's brother, plays the uh, kind of leather guy with the blonde wig. Okay, that is total fabrication. There are no drag, there are no guys in New York that are as well built and muscular as Gene Davis, who was in 10 to Midnight. So we know exactly he was nude through the whole movie with Charles Bronson playing a kind of gay killer in that. Yeah. And of course, his brother was bisexual Brad Davis from Midnight Express, who died of AIDS. Mm -hmm. So it's all there. And uh, that character is just completely wacko. Why he would wear a long blonde wig and, and be in, out in the street in the daytime dressed like that. What cruising shows you is the fact that when you walk into a gay bar in this movie, you are no longer in the real world. And you're also not the person you were when you walked into this world. Whether you're a doctor, uh, a stockbroker, uh, a day laborer, when you put on the leather and you go down to that bar, no one knows what you do for a living. No one asks you what you do for a living. You are now in a world where your entire value is your desirability. Mm -hmm. The rules of attraction, the rules of attraction and the danger involved in trying to hook up with strangers. 
this is all there. But of course, there's that's the same problem in the heterosexual world with dating, whether it's grinder or tender, you're dealing with people that could hurt you, you know. Well, you bring and, up uh, yeah. I think that I think there's an element. Of, this is more cruising is more like a jallo than it is a police procedure. It's not a police procedural really at all. And there's so little action in it in terms of car chases and shoot 'em ups. It's such a 360 degree turn from French Connection. But then let's talk about Boys in the Band, which is the other gay movie that William Friedkin directed early on before The Exorcist. Boys in the Band is based on a Broadway play. It's about a birthday party where six gay men get together and celebrate the birthday of Harold, who once was an ice skater and now they call him the frozen fruit. And he has this party and they give him a, a, a rent boy dressed as a cowboy and through the evening fueled with alcohol and drugs, they confront each other and their, their you know, uh, the realities of being gay post, but before Stonewall. So it's really not, it's a great movie. It's an honest movie. It's a movie that Billy did following uh, 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 Mark Crowley's play, Almost to the Letter, only going outside. I mean, it's basically in one set. Yeah. But it does deal with gay characters. And a couple of the guys that are in Boys in the Band are in Cruising. For example, one of the guys that's murdered in the Peep Show owns the fashion house. I mean, in, in, um, uh, the, the guy that owns the fashion house and dies in the peep show in Cruising, in Boys in the Band, he is the sec the, he's Larry's boyfriend. Oh, okay. In that. And uh, there are a lot of similarities. Cliff Gorman, that played the most effeminate of the characters, was the only one in it besides Peter White that wasn't gay. The entire cast was gay, and most of them died of AIDS, except for Peter White and Cliff Gorman. Well, you, when, yeah. when the guy playing the cowboy, Robert de Toro, who was actually a hustler in real life, when he died of AIDS, Cliff Gorman and his wife took him in and they took care of him. Well, so th these people were like a family. So Freakin is very, he's very cognizant of the gay world, but he really didn't know that much about it. And Cruising is, a, is a, an entirely, you do not say this is a movie based on true, a real story. I mean, it is like that. You want to say The Exorcist is based on a true story? Are we going to get that stupid? Because uh, uh, of course, there's no truth in that at all, uh, because there are no such things as exorcisms or possessions. But but it's good fodder for a movie. But with Cruising, you have a film where you really don't know where you are at any given point. Let me ask you something, because you, you mentioned this earlier, and this is something that was always kind of fascinating to me from a historical standpoint. When I first saw this movie a few years ago, you're watching it. It's in New York City in the early 80s. It's about the dangers of promiscuity. Like you said, it affects everyone, not just the gay community, the straight community, but especially in New York City at that time. When I was watching and I said, oh, this is clearly a metaphor for AIDS. But historically, AIDS did not become a national pandemic until years later. Is that a case? No, no, no. It's yeah. a, no, no. I, the, the, the flaw in cruising yeah. is that, and, and why Arthur Bell, what Arthur Bell should have been complaining about. Yeah. The, the Arthur Bell was a critic and writer at the Village Voice at the time cruising was being made, and he encouraged the gay community to boycott the movie. Yeah. But, the problem with cruising is that because it's because it's heterosexuals that are making it. Mm -hmm. The point of the movie is that it's 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 a condemnation of homosexuality as a lifestyle, because when you take women out of the equation, what you're doing is you're damning yourself. Mm -hmm. You're 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 never going to be happy because you don't have a wife and kids. You know what a lie that is. How many divorces and kids that have been? I'm a victim of divorced parents. So I know exactly what I'm talking about. But the movie paints a picture that gay men live this dangerous lifestyle that sex and the, and the grave are, are utterly predisposed. That if you go off with someone, you're gonna die. And, if you're, and of course, the ultimate thing was AIDS, which was coming. If yeah. you look at American Horror Story, the New York one that just, uh, that just aired a few months ago, mm -hmm. they took cruising and did the same thing with it, only they added AIDS. Yeah. 
But basically what they're saying is men change clothes, they remove their normal behavior and they walk down into this dark pit, which is very sexualized and not in a negative way. There is a glitter to it. There is an eroticism about it. The kind of sex Al Pacino pretends to have with his wife is the kind of sex he has with men. Having sex with men is an entire, it's very macho, very testosterone driven. Everything is violent. It's got anal penetration with, you know, bang, bang, bang. When he's wearing those leather straps on his arms and he's holding the bed frame while he's banging this girl, she wouldn't have put up with that five minutes if they had been in any kind of a normal relationship prior to this movie. So yeah. I'm beginning to wonder if she really exists at all. But the fact is, what was William Friedkin trying to tell us here? It's based on a story that Gerald Walker wrote, but they didn't really follow it except for a cop going undercover. But when a cop goes undercover the way Al Pacino is, it's like his interaction with Paul Servino and the other policemen, it's like he's an outsider there. He's not yeah. really part of the police force. And when he's picked up for the Skip Lee thing, when they bring that giant black guy in there, Al Pacino's just as frightened in the police station as the guy, because he's really not a policeman. Yeah. They know, I think he was put in that. I mean, the, 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 the undercurrent of that is that the police force know that Steve Burns is a latent homosexual. And they just put him in, in the right environment to bring it out. Yeah. And that's exactly what happens. Al Pacino's character goes through a rite of passage and comes out the other end, gay, but dangerous. Yeah. And I, I, I'm assuming that's what cruising is really about. Yeah. Well, you know, you said it yourself. He was a heterosexual director, but especially at a time when these type of stories weren't even told on any level, why do you think he was so comfortable with the material, like the boys in the band, cruising, especially cruising, some of those shots are pretty erotically charged. Like, yes. what do you think, like, what was it about Freakin that made him so comfortable with that, presenting that material? I don't know that there was. I mean, yeah. I, I don't, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. Because Pacino won't even talk about this movie today. Yeah. And he never played another character like it, except for Dog Day Afternoon, where he's a gay character in that as well. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm, it's, a, it's a moment in time where this happens, where this movie exists. And I will tell you something about it that's also kind of unusual. Yeah. Everyone I know, including you, that's not gay, mostly guys, all guys, although there are some women, Straight men are fascinated with this movie. Straight men are fascinated with this movie because it presents sexuality. Uh, first of all, there are no effeminate men in this. These are real guys. These are guys that are muscular, athletic, sports-minded. There's not a trace of anything feminine about them, including the guy in the white, in the yellow, in the blonde wig that's supposed to be a cross-dresser. This is sex. This is sex between men. This is what you don't see in American film. In American film up to this, they were hairdressers, limp-wristed. They all acted like Franklin Pangborn or, or Paul Lind. You know, everything is precious, duck lips, stereotypical. You know, cruising is not like that at all. And there's no disco music in it. The soundtrack of this is incredible because it's, it's uh, Willie DeVille, it's punk. Nothing in this movie actually ever happened in a game. Even the, and I've been in leather bars. I've been to the mine shaft. It was nothing. I mean, first of all, it's a movie. And a movie has its own set of rules. But you must admit that it does kind of, the bar scenes are lit like a jalo. Mm -hmm. It's like a Dario Argento film. Yeah. And remember, Dario was flirted with homosexuality in, uh, uh, was four flies on gray velvet because the police detective or the the detective in that's gay mm -hmm. and tries to help tony lobianco and dies so argento's had gay characters too i mean in europe it's a different story yeah but cruising is fascinating because it brings straight guys into it i've had more conversations with straight guys that know every line of dialogue from that movie why what is there is something inherent in that movie that attracts you 
to the possibility of having sex with another man. Mm-hmm. There's even a moment in the movie that I don't understand, and Billy couldn't explain it. I asked him. I said, when Steve Burns goes off with Skip Lee and they check into the hotel, the police break in when they're not supposed to. And what do they find? Al Pacino is tied up. And what is he, what's his dialogue? He's tied up on the bed, getting ready to be anally penetrated. And he goes, you're here too early. <laughs> what are you guys doing? What? You, what? you realize if we'd left them alone, they would have had sex. Yeah. This is Pacino. Pacino was having sex with this guy. Did anyone not notice that in the movie? You came too soon. Well, I've heard that before, but the point is to hear in the context. No, if you really follow this movie, through, there are so many bizarre rabbit holes to go down. Pardon the expression. Uh, yeah. you know, I mean, is Pacino remotely heterosexual? Probably not. Because he gets into it way too quick, way too quick. And the killers, of course, more from one. And, and Freakin said he used different voices. So he added to the confusion. Do you really have any idea who the killer is in this movie, Ryan? Well, you touched on it earlier, and that's what I was kind of curious about. Is this all just one big misdirect, or in your mind, do you think it is supposed to be multiple killers? Have you ever seen Denzel Washington in a movie called Fallen? No, I haven't. Fallen is about a demon, not unlike Pazuzu, that mm. that skips from one person to the other. And I think that's what cruising is. I think that the demon that's in The Exorcist got its start in cruising mm-hmm. because it just hops from one person to the next. Yeah, because there's a murder after the killer is caught and put in jail. They're still killing. So that explains, I mean, why would Friedkin have that ending if that weren't the case? Right, yeah. It's pretty clear that Pacino is now killing people. And you see Paul Servino's last line, when he sees, he looks, the camera goes right to Paul's face. And I asked Paul, Paul said, yes, I'm supposed to keep quiet. In other words, we now have a gay killer on the police force and we're going to keep him there. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep him there. You know what that implies? That that police department is hiring serial killers to get rid of gay people. Oh, wow. That's a pretty wild movie. I leave lesbians out of this. They're not involved in this at all. Yeah. They're gay, but they have nothing to do with this movie whatsoever. One thing I think it's interesting to touch upon, now you knew William Friedkin, or at least you had met him at multiple events. What was he like in person? Well, he's very smart, very, very aware, uh, amused by his celebrity, very quick to tell you when someone like Oliver Stone, oh, he's full of shit. Well, yeah, Oliver Stone is full of shit. And Friedkin's not going to lie about it. And uh, I just think he was one of the most refreshing, honest filmmakers in in Hollywood. Uh, Brilliant. He did have some misfires, but I mean, who doesn't? It's, you know, in Europe, if you're like Tennessee Williams and you've written a play called A Streetcar Named Desire, you don't have to write anything else. There's no gun to your head to write another masterpiece. One's enough, thank you. And with Freakin, if Freakin had never directed another movie, but Boys in the Band and The French Connection, we'd still be honoring him. (laughs) But, you know, to say, oh, well, Jade wasn't successful, so he's finished. You know, that's the way we are here. You know, you're only as good as your last movie. Which is unfair, obviously. Yeah, very unfair, because there's a lot of variables that go into making a movie. Was Cruising a film he was comfortable talking about? At least. Oh, to- yeah. Oh, to, I mean, he, Pacino, no. No. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just wonder, you know, when actors like that, the only reason someone's afraid to talk about something is because there's some truth in it. Yeah. So maybe Pacino is latently gay. Who knows? I mean, he, he and Nero made fun killer. of each other for so long. Yeah. He could and be a serial killer. You don't know. It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't yeah. matter if they were. Because, you know, the thing that happened, you know, we just lost Friedkin just a few weeks ago. But Friedkin lived to see actors not really. I mean, more straight actors are playing gay than gay actors. Mm-hmm. You know, Army Hammer didn't have any problem playing gay. Not that it helped him later on. It yeah. didn't destroy Timothy's career, did it? 
he went on to star in Dune and Willy Wonka, and he's probably one of the hottest actors in town. Yeah. And but, but look at the hottest actors: Harry Styles, Justin Timberlake, or not, or Justin Bieber. They're all flirting with gay. Mm -hmm. The Jonas Brothers. The Jonas Brothers' father said, "You cater to the gay men." You should see the way the Jonas Brothers dress on stage now. They're wearing jock straps. They're oh. not catering. They've long abandoned women. <laughs> women are not the target audience of these guys anymore. It's gay men because we have the disposable income too, of course. Yeah. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts on cruising? Is there anything people should look forward to the next time they watch it? Well, the next time you watch it, pay attention to the details. Pay attention to the things that Steve Burns says when he's being offered this case. Look at the way he puts on the eyeliner in his room when he's lifting the weights and the music accompaniment, all of it. There is a wealth of detail in this movie that you just can't take in on a first viewing. So I just find it fascinating. I think this movie will be discussed and analyzed forever. Because the more we look back on the history of movies and the more we look back on gay history in movies and gay history in America, uh, these films advise and consent where the first gay bar is shown on film, Boys in the Band, Cruising, The Killing of Sister George, Call Me By Your Name, probably The Sergeant. Uh, there's a wealth of movies and uh, I think there's gonna be more and more because cruising opened the door for all this. And, uh, and there's a very healthy interest in film noir and jallos right now. And I think cruising kind of, it's a horror film, it's a jallo. You know, it, does, it doesn't really, I think the reason it's so popular and the reason we, we'll be talking about it is because you can't pigeonhole it. How many times have we talked, even when we talked about Targets, Ryan, it pretty much was a cut and dry movie, right? Yeah. This is not like that. Even Leave Her to Heaven is pretty cut and dry. Mm -hmm. And they're all involving murder and serial killers, mm -hmm. but in a different way because we live in a different world. Yeah. But just be aware, my friends, that the, the subterranean hellish world of cruising is utterly, utterly in the imagination. There's no place, you can go to New York and there are some creepy places there to be sure. But you're not going to find what's in the movie because, as Hitchcock said, it's only a movie. So it's only a movie. But it's a good one. And I do think it's up for reappraisal. I'm just very curious to see what your audience says when they, when they get back to you. Yeah, I look forward to talking about the film with them after the show. But Mr. David DelVal, thank you so much for your time. We always appreciate hearing from you. Oh, I'll well, meet you. I love coming on. And for you in the audience, I hope you enjoyed the film. Once again, my name is Ryan Bijan. You have a good night. <laughs>